So I was mentioning earlier to some of you, I, I, I dreamt in Latin and Greek last night, honest. Uh, and I was uh, rehearsing in my dream uh, the opening passage of uh, Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War. And in the very first sentence uh, of his histories, he uh, explains why he undertook the work. He said, I wanted to create uh, a possession for always, a kutema esayon. Kutema is a thing. It's something tangible. It's hard. You can, you can touch it. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it put me in mind of uh, what I was going to be doing at 8 o'clock the next morning, namely discussing uh, the rationale uh, behind the uh, education reform law of 1993. Uh, and I. I, I think it was this notion that Tom and Mark and I had, and many others, that we wanted something that would last, something of a standard to which people could repair in after years, uh, if you will, that uh, led to um, our insistence uh, on essentially not only a foundation budget uh, for education for each, uh, each district, but also for, a, if you will, a, a foundation uh, curriculum. Uh, and uh, Tom is absolutely right that I was uh, rabid on the subject of funding. It, uh, it had long galled me that uh, Wellesley was funding at ten or eleven thousand dollars a year, and uh, the poorest districts, I forget whether where it was, but I would have said it was under three thousand. I would have said two and change. Uh, and, and that to me was just a flagrant violation of the equal protection laws. Uh, there were cases pending in the Supreme Courts of uh, various uh, states. Uh, relating to equalization of school funding between urban districts and suburban districts, between rich and poor. And I can recall saying to my staff that I'd rather do this myself than have some court uh, tell me uh, to do it, particularly when it was the right thing. Uh, we are privileged in this state to have had uh, the great John Adams draft our Constitution of 1781, which was uh, a precursor in many respects uh, to the uh, Federal Convention, uh, uh, Constitution of 1787. And uh, it was hard to see, and I clerked on the Supreme uh, Judicial Court of Massachusetts, so I had some familiarity with that provision. And it's kind of hard to see how you could uh, go with that status quo in educational funding and think that we were keeping faith with Adams's injunction to cherish uh, learning and, and uh, education. Uh, so, uh, you know, as, as Tom has pointed out, for too long uh, we were relying on property taxes to fund education uh, in this state, and that had a discriminatory implication. So I was uh, proud to be part of uh, the so-called grand bargain, uh, more money in exchange for standards and accountability. From where I stood, it wasn't uh, a grand bargain at all. It wasn't a compromise at all, because I was in favor of both halves of it. Uh, my favorite grand bargain, uh, while I'm in war story mode, was in, uh, in December of 1994, when the grand bargain was uh, a legislative pay increase in exchange for zeroing out the long-term capital gains tax. 1% per year for each year you hold the asset. So if you hold it for six years, whether it's real estate or Krugerrands, the long-term capital gains tax goes to zero. Uh, little, little did my uh, counterparties know or remember that in uh, the late 80s, early 90s, Barney Frank and I had proposed a $150,000 salary for members of Congress in exchange for certain limitations on uh, outside, uh, outside income. So, I had long been a proponent of higher legislative pay. I didn't want a legislature where you e either have uh, idealistic uh, uh, Democrat kids coming right out of college into the legislature, or big fat rich uh, white bread Republicans uh, who have uh, you know, a huge law practice or insurance practice and are just uh, dabbling in legislation to try to uh, stem the, the course of progress. Uh, <laughs> this is off the record, isn't it? <laughs> So, uh, you know, the, uh, the possession for all, I think of uh, a great education uh, as not being uh, notional, as being uh, more tangible uh, than notional. Uh, kind of like a, uh, the, the Japanese Netskis that uh, Edmund de Waal, uh, writes about in his book, uh, The Hair with Amber Eyes. Uh, the fact is, though, if you want a Japanese Netski or you want, you want a valuable, uh, uh, a, uh, a great education, you do have to pay for it. And that's why we went where we did. Uh, on the funding, and, and I think that was uh, uh, an essential, uh, essential part of that, uh, that law. Uh, so uh, you see where I'm going. Uh, the Common Core, uh, as has been mentioned, uh, proposes that uh, we, we go to uh, informational texts uh, rather than literature. 
uh, that we cut back on uh, useless appendages like Dickens and Wharton and Arthur Conan Doyle and uh, Mark Twain uh, in exchange for global awareness and uh, media literacy, uh, cross-cultural flexibility and adaptability. Uh, these, are, uh, these are our new standards. Uh, I, uh, uh, I don't know about no more Little Dorrit, no more Dombey and Son, no more Ethan Frome, no more Study in Scarlet, no more Speckled Band, no more Hound of the Baskervilles, not even the League of Red-Headed Men. <laughs> not to mention Huckleberry Finn, the greatest American novel. So uh, I, I'm not so sure about uh, these, uh, the Common Core uh, approach to things. It uh, kind of looks to me like uh, an apology for uh, muddle-headed uh, mediocrity. Uh, I, I'm put in mind of uh, something that Roman Haruska, who was a Republican senator from Nebraska, said in connection with one of uh, President Nixon's uh, proposed appointees to the Supreme Court. President Nixon had proposed Clement Hainsworth, who was uh, a well-respected chief judge of one of the circuit courts of appeals, uh, Judge Hainsworth was shot down uh, by the Democrats on the ground that he'd participated in a stock transaction that would have netted him a profit of $12 if he'd uh, thought it all through. So he was barred and President Nixon said, okay, you didn't like that one? Try this one. Uh, and he nominated a district judge from Florida who really uh, possessed no qualifications uh, for the Supreme Court and was almost unanimously described as a, having a mediocre intellect. This is too much for Senator Haruska, who rose on the floor of the United States Senate and said, so what if he's mediocre? There's plenty of Americans who have mediocre intelligence and are just mediocre people. Aren't they entitled to a little representation on the Supreme Court? <laughs> Quote, unquote. But, uh, you know, the answer is they're entitled to representation. Uh, they so obviously have it uh, in the United States Senate. <laughs> But uh, the, same, the same would not necessarily apply to the Supreme Court. And, and that's what we're doing here in, in trying to fashion uh, an educational system. We're, we're trying to create something more analogous to the Supreme Court, the best in all of us, uh, than a wholly representative uh, body or a, 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 a melting pot. Uh, the, the very word education, educo, here's where the Latin comes in. It's not all Greek. Uh, <laughs> means to uh, lead you up and out, right? It's a process, it improves you, it leads you up and out. So uh, I, I wish we could uh, you know, hire that great law firm of uh, Dickens, Doyle, Wharton, and Twain to uh, <laughs> persuade the current leaders of Massachusetts uh, uh, not to go down the road that I, I fear they may be headed. Now I get the politics of this, uh, and when President Obama and Secretary Duncan say, let's, let's, let's do this and have states sign up, uh, if I'm Governor Patrick, and I'm a, I'm a big pal, indeed a mentor to President Obama, uh, I'm going to raise my hand and say, great idea, Prez, let's go. Let's all do this and create a sense of enthusiasm and uh, uh, energy and momentum, and I'm a great believer in unleashing the energies of the electorate. Uh, and when Bush 41 was in office and he proposed things, I would always raise my hand and say, yeah, Massachusetts wants to play. Come on, everybody, the water's fine. Uh, same under President Clinton, who although he was a Democrat, he and I were very close, I would raise my hand and say, let's go, let's play. Uh, I trusted those guys. I'm sure that Governor Patrick trusts uh, President Obama as to the framework and the need for enthusiasm and participation here. But my understanding is that you're allowed to adopt the Common Core and then say, we just want to add on a few things here. And Massachusetts has, I gather, uh, added some stuff to the Common Core. And my suggestion to Governor Patrick and the leadership would be, by all means, uh, adopt the Common Core, lock, stock, and barrel, and just add the MCAS and all our standards and all our accountability without really, you know, rubbing it in, in anybody else's face or saying that they have to do it. That way we would have, we would do the President a favor, a political favor, political participation, and we'd still have our cake uh, and eat it too. Uh, part B, uh, of my attention here is uh, a favorite of mine, charter schools. Uh, I often say that I, I testified many times before the legislature uh, in, my, in my two terms, and only once did I ever have a following wind, that is to say a wind uh, at my back in the hearing room. Usually I was going up saying, this is why we have to cut this, this is why we have to cut that. Uh, the one time that I had a following wind was testifying before the Joint Committee on Education, and the topic was charter schools. 
And I was all in favor of charter schools, and I was saying we should give them real estate, and we need to uh, empower them. And uh, I, there was a very frowny face set, set of uh, individuals up on the, the dais, the, uh, uh, the education chairs, and a couple of, uh, couple of members. And, and one reason they might have been frowning was because there was huge cheers from behind me, from 350 people who had jammed the hearing room every time I said anything. I was always booed when I testified, except on this one, <laughs> one occasion. And uh, the people looking out from the dais at the room would not have seen a single white face in that room, except for mine. Uh, these were inner city parents uh, who understood that they and their kids were being robbed by the current system of education, and charter schools offered them uh, a way up and a way out, an education, if you will. Uh, so it got worse. Uh, I, I then said, after my opening remarks, I, I held up a, a brochure of uh, the teachers' union, and I said, uh, and, and that you know produced a lightening of the mood and a brightening from the faces on the dais. I held it up. They thought I was going to read from it, uh, and so I did. I read several passages, uh, and um, uh, at, at the conclusion, I said, "So these are representative passages." Uh, uh, chair and chair, uh, and uh, in total, if you read the entire brochure, you would see 37 references to money and political influence. They said, so? I said, not one reference to children or to education. So immediately the finger comes out, now Mr. Weld, you're playing the blame game. We don't want to play the blame game around here, that's not constructive. Well, that was a remark lifted from uh, uh, union rhetoric uh, of, the, uh, of the time. Uh, and uh, th that uh, was probably the closest I came to open, uh, open confrontation uh, with uh, a legislative committee. But I do think that the, uh, the, the thrust of the proponents of uh, uh, money and political influence in education as opposed to children and uh, actual content, uh, their thrust is, I think, retrograde, a guild mentality, medieval, all those words uh, spring to mind. So to me, it's, uh, it's a no-brainer that uh, the two issues of current interest in the charter school debate, uh, the, cap, uh, the cap has got to be lifted. We have a waiting list of 53,492 kids who want to get into charter schools and can't because of the cap. Uh, parents and, and kids are voting with their feet, and we should, we should respect that. Uh, and the other issue is that we should remove the proven provider requirement uh, for uh, for uh, under uh, underserved uh, districts, which, in my view at least, uh, that requirement is contrary to the, the uh, spirit of innovation, which is the motivation for charter schools uh, in the first place. If you can't trust anyone except a proven provider, uh, you shouldn't have trusted anyone to start a charter school in the first place. It's just not not logical. So. That's about all I know about penguins, and I'm going to stop there so that Tom Birmingham will have more time to answer questions. <laughs> Thank you.